Did you know that all penguins are left-handed? Bet you didn't know that, because that's not true. I made it up. Well, it might be true, but still, I did make it up. It's easy to say things that aren't true and get people to believe them, especially when they sound sciencey and are mixed in with well-known facts. On that note, let's take a look at some popular science videos on the origin of life and point out a few things they claim that are not exactly true. Let's get into it. The first sort of made-up thing you should be on the lookout for is what we call Imagination Storytime Land. Let's start with these videos from Be Smart and Stated Clearly. When discussing the origin of life, they use words like These molecules must have copied and made more of themselves, some a little different than the others. And a few of those codes and instructions must have been better at doing whatever they did. Ah, it must have happened. These building blocks combine to form highly complex and orderly structures like genes, proteins, and cell membranes. Easy as that, they just combine. Unfortunately, the RNA-only world went extinct more than three billion years ago. See how they slipped into the past tense as if these things are proven? Notice there were not a whole lot of sources cited or evidence given. Just imagination and hopeful possibility. If you see words like, this must have happened, or people casually slipping into the passive voice or past tense, you can be pretty confident that it's story time. People only say something must have happened if they're really not sure that it happened, but want to act like they're sure that it did happen. If I went to the store yesterday, I wouldn't say, huh, I must have went to the store. I'd say, I went to the store. Now, we're not criticizing them for having ideas about what may have happened. Having a hypothesis is fine. Great, even. If it's openly disclosed and everybody's on the same page, nothing wrong with that. But it's frequently presented so matter-of-factly and interspersed with real scientific facts that it's easy for people to mistake it for fact when it's far from the case. They're overcompensating. It's a false confidence. All right, you know how to spot story time. Cool. The next place we'll go on our tour of science videos is half truth land Technically true, but also misleading. Like this. Hey, hon. Have you seen my cookies? No. I don't currently see them. Technically true. A lot of times, what is said is technically true, but critical information is left out to intentionally or unintentionally mislead people. Miller's experiment took some simple chemicals like those found on early Earth. Did you catch it? Like those found on early Earth. They used simple chemicals like those found on early Earth. He knows that they didn't use chemicals actually thought to be on a prebiotic Earth but they were like them. Chemicals are chemicals after all, right? Not only that, but they used ultra pure chemicals at extremely high concentrations that are not found in nature and purchased them from industrial laboratory supply shops. Where are you gonna find those on a prebiotic earth? You won't, that's where. Like those found on early earth, bubbled them up through a tube, zapped them with electricity, and after a few days floating in this soup, he found amino acids, the building blocks of proteins and one of the essential ingredients for life. That's true, but the rest of the story is that they mostly ended up with garbage. Any trace amounts of useful material would have been lost in a sea of toxic byproducts and tar. Researchers have recently discovered that many of the building blocks of life, amino acids and sugars, exist inside of meteorites. It's well known that space is full of the chemical building blocks of life, from amino acids to DNA and RNA letters, buried inside meteorites like this one that fell on Australia in 1969. This tells us that these special molecules are being produced spontaneously all throughout our solar system and may have been common on the ancient Earth. It shows the chemistry that makes biological molecules can happen pretty much anywhere. The half of the story that's true is that we have found some building blocks in meteorites. The other half of the story they don't disclose is that, much like the Miller-Urey experiment, these building blocks and letters are utterly unusable because they're mixed in with millions of other molecules that we don't want and are even toxic to life. You could probably find some undigested molecules of flour and sugar inside of a fresh dog poo, but that doesn't mean you're on your way to making a birthday cake. Well, unless you don't like the person. Cakes need lots of pure, uncontaminated ingredients. So does life. 
Bringing up these meteorites is half true and very misleading. What made Miller's experiment so special was it gave us proof regular non-life stuff could become cool life stuff super easily. Super easily. If you understood him to mean that non-living things can easily be turned into living things and that abiogenesis is super easy, you could be forgiven for misunderstanding this misleading half-truth. What was actually meant is that chemicals, non-living stuff, purchased from industrial chemical supply shops can be turned into different non-living stuff under circumstances that are completely irrelevant to the origin of life super easily. But put that way, the argument seems much less convincing though. Half-truths are one thing, but let's go deeper now, beyond half truth land in order to find claims that are so exaggerated, so far removed from reality, we need to venture into outright falsehood jungle. Scientists have constructed ribozymes that can copy themselves, just like DNA gets copied. No reference is provided because this flat out isn't true. There have been lots of experiments that make misleading claims, but actually reading the papers shows that they steal things from life and don't actually end up with anything self-replicating. If you're okay with that definition of self-replication, I'd like to sell you some... Self-baking cupcakes! Oh, how lovely! Just add cupcake mix and bake at 350 for 15... What? Or steal cupcakes from someone who already has the... This isn't self-baking at all! This is what they're selling you. Having completely misrepresented the possibility of RNA self-replication, this Stated Clearly video goes on to make false claims about cell membranes and DNA replication. Some self-assemble into hollow spheres, almost identical, to, almost, identical to, almost identical to the membranes of modern living cells. This is outright false. The description is not even close, certainly not almost identical. See this video if you want to see the required capabilities of cell membranes. Saying these hollow spheres are almost identical to real cell membranes is like saying a dinosaur-shaped chicken nugget is almost identical to a real T-Rex, or a cup with a string on it is almost identical to a smartphone. A paper airplane is almost identical to a commercial aircraft. You get the point. Others self-assemble into long columns, remarkably similar to the strands of DNA found in life. Anyone with even a basic understanding of DNA should be scratching their head at this claim, pondering how these stacks of disks could possibly be remarkably similar to DNA. This has no resemblance to the structure of DNA, how it's produced or replicated, or how it stores information. As a side note, there aren't any references in the original video by Stated Clearly, but these images look like the work of Otto and team. They found that these disk molecules stack up spontaneously, and if the stack is stirred or shaken to break it into two smaller stacks, each will continue to grow. From this, they claim self-replication, but there's no replication of information and no resemblance to what DNA is or how it functions in life at all. This last one is a doozy. Researchers have found that with a little bit of assistance, base pairing allows chains of RNA to replicate and evolve. Here's how it works. When a long chain of RNA is suspended in cool water with high concentrations of free nucleotides, the chain can act as a template for its own replication. Nucleotides automatically base pair with their partners on the existing chain. If their backbone atoms form chemical bonds with each other, and by the way, this is the part that currently requires assistance from researchers, we're not yet sure how this would have happened in the wild, a complementary RNA strand is born, one with the exact inverse sequence of the original. If the water is then heated, paired bases lose their grip allowing both chains to act as templates when the cycle repeats. The only thing wrong with this claim is pretty much everything about it contradicts well-established science. Here's just five reasons why. It starts with this beautiful RNA molecule that needs to be duplicated. This can't happen prebiotically. Notice that the template RNA is unfolded. RNA like this has no function. If it remains unfolded, it can't do anything and will never be selected for because replicating it doesn't grant any benefit because it doesn't do anything. But if it was folded, it couldn't be duplicated. And the colder the water is, the more likely that it'd be folded up on itself as well. This handsome RNA also isn't bonded with anything else. Unlikely, especially considering that it could bond with itself and the overwhelming amounts of garbage floating around in nature, other interfering molecules and ions getting in the way. But water would also prevent the bonds we want. 
because hydrogen bonds between a nucleotide and the water itself are stronger than they are between individual nucleotides. In other words, these molecules are not single and ready to mingle. They've already got a honey. They also show free nucleotides in high concentration floating in water. Where do you even get high concentrations of free nucleotides on a prebiotic Earth? The same place you'd find high concentrations of free $100 bills. Only in your dreams. It's not degraded. Again, unlikely considering that its lifespan is similar to that of cottage cheese, especially since the water it'd be floating in would degrade the RNA and the individual nucleotides. This is why in laboratory synthesis, storage, and use of DNA monomers actually occurs in the absence of water. Now to mention ions that would damage the RNA, especially divalent cations like magnesium that cause RNA to cut itself into tiny pieces, also any increase in pH would destroy the RNA. Even if the template and complementary strand could form, they can't, once they got to be longer than about 20 or 30 nucleotides, they'd permanently become a dead end, because not even boiling water could separate them without destroying them completely. So when this video says, here's how it works, you should translate it in your head to be, here's how it doesn't work, but we need it to work this way for our hypothesis to have any hope, so please be nice. But if the evidence isn't really there like they say, why do such smart people cling to a poorly supported, scientifically dubious belief? A big reason is something called Methodological Naturalism. This is a hidden philosophical starting point that ultimately assumes only one possible explanation. Natural causes. No matter how remote or impossible the odds. And ignores all others, no matter how face-slappingly obvious. Methodological naturalism is how these videos can claim that the evidence we see all makes sense only if, only if, their theories of abiogenesis are true, and this idea that the most promising idea right now is that life emerged from chemistry. Because they've excluded all others, so it's the only possible idea. This is like winning first place in a race when you're the only one in it. After you exclude all possible alternatives, we shouldn't be surprised that the remaining idea becomes the most promising idea, even if it's false. The question being asked in Origin of Life Science is, how did natural processes begin life? Instead of the more open and honest question, how did life begin? If we were investigating a death, the best thing to do would be to come at it with an open mind. Maybe it was natural causes, maybe not. Either way, we'll collect all the evidence before drawing a conclusion. Perhaps the deceased was quite elderly, alone in the house with all the doors locked, and he was found peacefully lying in bed. Natural causes would be a pretty compelling case. On the other hand, if we found a young healthy person with signs of a struggle, the house was broken into, multiple bite wounds in the back. Someone did this would clearly be the better fit to explain the evidence we saw. If the forensic scientists did what origin of life scientists do, they would misdiagnose the cause of death. They'd not only be wrong, but embarrassingly and confidently so. Sure, they could try to explain away all the evidence they found to fit their preferred conclusion. Maybe they just don't want to live in a world where people are murdered. So all evidence of murder is ignored or explained away. Nah, this house wasn't broken into. That rock that broke the glass in the door is a naturally geologically formed object, easily explained away by physics. And about the house being trashed, maybe a strong wind just blew through and messed up the place. Or an earthquake, plenty of hypotheses that could explain that as well, no problem. Now, the odd shaped wounds in the back, I'll admit, Hard to explain, but that doesn't mean it was a murder. This was clearly a death due to natural causes. Forensic science, it just needs to advance a bit further and uh, eventually we'll find a way to explain away this evidence. Obviously, that detective would be fired, rightfully so. But not so in the origin of life science. He'd be given tenure, a big funding grant, and invited to do a TED talk. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoy this kind of video, make sure you subscribe and you can hit that bell so you can be notified when we release more videos.